Good afternoon. A few years ago, my colleagues and I decided we needed to understand what is automation going to do to our workforce? How is it going to change the nature of work? We can see automation all around us. We all shop online. You probably came through an airport on the way which required no human interaction. There's a company in California that has built a machine that will flip and build a burger perfectly without human intervention. But what does it all mean? We decided we needed a fact base. So we started in an unusual way. We built an AI that could read job descriptions and would tell us for each job what the automation potential would be based on known technologies and projected uptake trends. So we fed the AI with thousands of job descriptions and it started to tell us interesting things. The first thing it told us was that only 1% of jobs will be fully automated and disappear. It's bad news if you're a sewing machine operator. But for the rest of us, not so bad. Perhaps more interestingly, it told us that for 60% of jobs, 30% of the activities could be automated. So for almost all of us, there are things that we do that are actually low value and could be automated. For me, I'm really hoping someone will automate all that email I don't want to read. But then we looked at this, we said, we're not, we're not sure we really trust this AI. Is this true? Can we tell our clients about this? Can we trust it? So we went back to old methods, and we had an army of business analysts look at the same information. And they came up with very similar numbers, not quite the same. And we said, that's strange, machine and human, different numbers. Turned out that the analysts were making errors. The machines were not. So what do we conclude from this? Well, firstly, that management consultants' days are numbered. Well, maybe not, but certainly part of what we do is, is very automatable. Secondly, that the picture is a little bit more complicated than it first appears. Let me tell you a bit about that. So automation is a bit scary, but it's promising, and some would say it's essential. It will drive us. Let me say more. Anyone who, like me, looks at a lot of social media will be familiar with Atlas the robot from Boston Dynamics. Atlas can perform backflips and climb stairs and open doors and all sorts of wonders. Um, but this is the kind of reaction that we see a lot of on social media. We dead. It's all over. Robots are not only going to take our jobs, they're going to take our lives. So there's a lot of paranoia, a lot of paranoia and a need for education. And the reason there's a need for education is that automation turns out to be very important for our society and our economy. If you look at the last 50 years for the large, larger nations combined, you'll see that half of GDP growth has come from the growth in the labor force, from employment. The other half has come from productivity gains, most of which is underpinned by automation. If you look forward, the demographic effect means that we can no longer rely on employment growth for that half of the puzzle. So, if anything, we need to rely more and invest more in automation going forward if we're going to sustain the kind of GDP growth levels that we are used to. The good news is that as all this happens, we believe more jobs will be created than lost. So net-net, despite all of this automation, we'll end up with more jobs. How's that? Well, and apologies for those at the back. You don't need to read every line here. But this is a picture of the US labor force from 1850 to now, cut by occupation. And the big wedge in the middle is agriculture. In 1850, 58% of the US labor force was working in the field. 58%. Today it's 2% due to automation, mechanization, farm machines. The same thing has happened in mining and in manufacturing. The good news, though, is while all that's gone on, 
There's been explosive growth in other, in other occupations. Education, healthcare, financial services, and so on. And those have, that growth has more than taken up the difference. So there's been some imbalances along the way, but broadly, there's been enough work to go around and remain so at this point. So all good. And going forward, we believe there are many drivers that will continue that trend, avenues for new employment, new growth. These are not the only seven, but these are seven we believe are most significant. The first is rising, rising incomes. As we become wealthier, we spend more. We buy more stuff, we go out more, we pay for entertainment. And that creates jobs. Secondly, that same demographic effect as our population ages will mean we need a lot more healthcare workers. So that's a booming place. Infrastructure, in many developed economies, we have roads and bridges which are decaying. They need replacing and updating, and that will drive work. Climate change is a problem for all of us. If there's one bright side, is that it creates jobs. There will need to be a lot of construction, wind farms and the like, over the next decades, and other technologies we haven't even thought of yet. And then finally, marketization of unpaid work. There's a lot of things that we used to do for nothing in the home, and now we pay people to do. Uh, for example, ordering meals, cleaning, and so on. So overall, when you add this together, across the developed nations, we estimate this will create more labor demand than that displaced by these technologies coming. So overall, it's good news. I'll show you some examples. If you like, take the example on the right, which is India, you can see that something like 60 million jobs in the next 15 years get displaced by automation. And in addition, there's another 140 million or so workers coming into the labor force in India. But the blue bar in the middle, there's more than 200 new jobs being created by these trends that I've just mentioned. So overall, we expect, and we project, India to be short of labor. Same in Germany. The US is a bit of an outlier, actually. We expect the US to have too much labor because there's so much displacement through technology of the existing roles. But overall, if you look globally at the large nations, it's net positive. However, and there's always a but, isn't there? However, getting there is going to be difficult. This transition is going to be difficult, or may be difficult, if we don't take a bunch of actions which we'll come on to. And why is it going to be difficult? Well, the first thing is that the impact of automation depends on who you are and your level of education. So if you have less than a high school degree, fast food, cooks, and so on, using current technologies, 55% of the work can be automated. So we would expect to see the labor force halved. If, you're, if you have a higher education degree, you're a doctor and lawyer, it's much smaller, it's less than a quarter, so the impact on you is smaller. And of course, these new jobs that are being created, many of them are in the higher skills categories. Right? You, you don't design wind farms if you've not got a high school degree. That's the extreme example. But overall, there's a mixed mismatch, and there's a skill gap which is opening up right now, which is resulting in, in many economies, I certainly see this where I'm from in the UK, there are many jobs and there are many workers available, but, that, but matching them is very hard because of the skills difference. And we expect that to accelerate, to become more pronounced going forward. A second challenge is that just because you're driving up GDP, it doesn't always mean that that trickles down into the labor force. This is a picture of the Industrial Revolution in the UK, and the top line shows you DDP per worker, and you can see during this period it, it um, grew very nicely. This was the period, of course, when um, automated uh, factories first became a reality, and you could, for example, create yarn uh, and weave cloth using a machine. And what happened you, at the same time, though, is that real wages stagnated for a period of about 40 years. And what happened here is that the machines took away jobs from weavers who were working mostly from home and people working on the fields. And 
there was a sudden rise in unemployment. Meanwhile, the factories were able to employ labor at very, very low rates because of the unemployment. And labor got a rough end of the deal, whilst the owners of factories uh, became very wealthy indeed. In the end, policy had to shift. There was a shift in policy required to ensure an effective redistribution of that wealth in a way that was sustainable and created more jobs at the same time. A third problem is that most states are not investing in training to fill this skills gap. Again, don't worry about every stat here, but I, to take uh, my own country again, an example, the UK, the state invests basically nothing in retraining workers, relying rather on the private sector to pick up the slack. And in all other states, we're seeing a decline in that investment in training, except, except Denmark. So it's not helping the gap. So that's the problem. What are we going to do about it? There's a route here which if we just run forward, we create, we run, we don't learn the lessons of history, and the same things happen again, which is we create all of the, you know, we create this prosperity and this GDP growth from automation, but we don't do it in a way that allows the workforce we have to move into those new jobs. And we don't do it in a way which distributes income in a fair way and creates a workable society. Arguably, you can already see some of those tensions emerging. So here's how we think about the priorities. Firstly, strength and demand. It's not been popular for many years, but the idea of investing in infrastructure, for example, for, for, to paying government money to rebuild roads and, and bridges, we believe will be essential. But it's more than that. It's also investing in green tech, in renewables. The previous panel was pointing out that that could be a point of advantage for Europe, and I would agree with that. But there's also something about entrepreneurship. Despite what you read, the number of entrepreneurs in most developed economies is falling. And we need more entrepreneurs. We need ways of encouraging and incentivizing entrepreneurs to come forward and start new businesses, in potentially in whole new industries, which will help this transition. Secondly, we need to invest in human capital. The days where you turned up, you got a job, and you stayed there for your whole life and retired are long, long over. What is required is the ability to retrain and repurpose throughout your career and throughout your life, either with one company or through many. The most advanced organizations are already investing heavily in numerous different types of training program. They will allow you to take career breaks and retrain. They will subsidize night classes. They will provide micro-training on the job. Various ways of retooling and reskilling workers in a way that they can be more and more productive through their careers rather than stagnating. But back to my previous exhibit, the state needs to help too. The state will need to invest in making sure that labor has the right tools for the jobs coming going forward, both in the education system and also on an ongoing basis. Thirdly, our, our labor markets need to be di more dynamic. What we see is not only big imbalances, I've just showed you an imbalance between different geographies in terms of where jobs will be created, but we see the same thing on a state level within countries. Um, and so we need to create a market which allows labor to move around more easily, and actually we're seeing labor mobility falling, not increasing. But it's also about more diverse forms of work. In most economies now, you're either a standard full-time worker or you're something else not quite easily categorized. Some people call it the gig economy, sometimes some people call it part-time work. There are various different flavors. We don't really have a good language or structures yet in most economies for dealing with that kind of work. And as a result, those workers are penalized. They don't get the same rights, they don't get the same sick pay, they don't get the same pension portability. And that's a problem. And then finally, we need to rethink income and transition. If you are moving between jobs or moving geographically, or you get displaced, it's hard, and we need to give those workers a safety net and allow them to take the risk to move on to new things and new priorities. So in summary, 
Automation, while scary, is a good thing. In fact, it's essential. Secondly, more jobs will be created than lost, but it's patchy where they come. Thirdly, the transition is not going to be easy unless we think about these four actions and we put them into effect. As a group of leaders, we have a choice. We can play forward with the existing playbook and on the route we're taking, which will not learn from history and will create a lot of disruption. Or we can learn those lessons, take these actions, and ensure we have a more prosperous future. Thank you.